Man, you already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life, and we're back. We're going to get into some of these street stories today. Some of the things that took place, you know, leading up to my long-term incarceration. Some of these, these shady, shady dudes, shady people I met and dealt with on a daily basis in the streets. Times I was done wrong, but chose to continue dealing with somebody. We've all been crossed. We've all had somebody do us wrong. And the crazy part is that most times we accept them back in. Whether it's because we love them, we consider them a friend, the family, our history together, whatever the case may be. Now she was drinking, that's why she did that. Or he had took those pills, or he was doing bad. That's why he did that. Hard to forgive at times, but when you're caught up in that lifestyle, you don't really forgive, you just accept. You know, a lot of us don't live the same life. A lot of my viewers have never been to jail. That's why they watch me for that insight. A lot of my viewers were never in the streets. That's why they watch me for that insight. Today, I'm going to give you all that insight into how I was moving, who I was, and the type of people I hung around. Prior to going away <laughs> Y'all know I done seen it Y'all know I done lived it So let's relive it Go ahead and do my life update real quick Told y'all about the new truck we bought, right? Been trying to get more Guys are acting crazy when it comes to the prices of trucks With everybody getting checks and unemployment The car lots have marked the prices up on cars Good credit, no credit, bad credit Buy here, pay here. Well, we're doing that. They're trying to sell these vehicles at the price that they would sell it if it was pretty much leased. As if you're paying 25% interest on it. So a $6,000 vehicle is now going for $14,000. All the guys with trucks, they got trucks for sales, local sales, have decided, well, shit, if they can get $14,000 for their truck, I can get $14,000 for mine. Not realizing they're only getting $14,000 for it because they're financing it. They're probably going to get that truck back four times <clears throat> before it finally comes back. The trucks are rolling out at twelve, fourteen thousand with 270,000 miles on them. So I was happy I got this truck for, you know, the six grand price. We went to go do the plugs. Nicole packs because the truck was stuttering, t -t 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 not acting right. Spent a you know good amount of money on these coils and plugs. Get seven of them done. Get to the very back on this three valve five point four, and the spark plug is broke off inside the block. Hmm. So I ordered a broken spark plug remover, and we're gonna play hell getting that spark plug out so that we can finally have the truck in the tip top shape it should be secondly was going through some old instagram messages yesterday i seen bubba sparks hit me up kind of crazy to think bubba sparks the rapper had hit me up and said he watches the videos i remember the deliverance album you know i, I remember it's getting ugly mr college park you know booty 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 like i remember all that so yeah, shout out to Bubba Man, shout out to Yellow Wolf, Struggle Jennings, Jelly Roll, all them dudes. Those are real dudes. Those are dudes that ain't got no shame in, in who they are and they know who they are. That'll walk on the stage in a pair of leather pants and perform with 3-6 Mafia. You know what I mean? That's what a real one is. Someone that does not care what everybody else thinks about them and it's just true to who they are. Secondly, my wife's daughter moved in with us. She's in her 20s. About a month or so ago, and her little boy moved in, Mr. Saint. Saints, too, my son is about to turn four. So my house at all given times is like the WWE. It's like there's a full-fledged MMA match going on at all points between the four-year-old and the two-year-old. And Saint's a big boy. At two years old, 37 pounds. My son is four. He's 39 his weight's perfect. He's where he should be. Saint's almost as big as my four-year-old. It ain't nothing to look over and see them trading punches, punching each other in the face, and you got to break them up. 
So yeah, that's my my update on life. It gets crazy sometimes, but you already know, man. I love it. I wouldn't I wouldn't change anything. I don't mind having my stepdaughter at the house and my I guess you would call it my little grandson. It's a beautiful thing to be able to help people, be in a position to help people. And I love my family, man. I love the family I've created. Those that are close to me, I'm loyal to them. And anything I can do to further them and watch them succeed, I'm going to do. Let's go ahead and jump into these stories, man. So with today's story, I was thinking, there's a lot of them. A lot of shady dudes. But for me to give y'all the stories, I got to I gotta start at the beginning. Got to give y'all the backdrop on how I came in contact with all these individuals I'm going to speak on today. Pause. Red Bull. We moved to Virginia around the time I was 13. We moved here from Henderson, North Carolina. Prior to that, we lived in Charlotte. And what led us here was a shootout that my pops was involved in. And what led to the shootout was a fight that I had got in. My dad had a friend at the time named Joe. Dad's dead now. We'll leave Joe's last name out of it. But he had a friend named Joe, big Indian man. He'd known a long time. Curly ass hair, right? Joe was El Plaga. He was the plug. Joe had everything, man. Joe had all the powder. Joe had all the all the weed. I'm talking more weed than most people have ever seen in their life. I was seeing at a young, you know, young age as a child. I remember watching boxes. I mean, big ass boxes full of weed be put into the living room and packaged into pounds, right? Joe's got this son, little Joe. And I was known around the neighborhood for just being a little live wire. Even at 12, 13 years old, I was a I was a mean kid. I'd been through a lot. I dealt with a lot. And uh, when it came to other kids, if y'all wanted, you know, wanted a problem, I didn't have a problem fighting at that age. I would fight and not think twice about it. Joe decides one day he wants to throw rocks at my sister. This is little Joe. And we're down the street and I'm yelling at him, stop. And these ain't no little rocks, man. These are good sized rocks, big ass chunks of rocks. And he keeps throwing and I'm running towards him and I'm telling him, stop. He throws one and I hear my sister cry. I turn around. My little sister's on the ground. She got busted in the head with one of these rocks. I take off after Joe's ass. Joe is way bigger than me. Joe is one of those, those kids that you look at him, you're like, damn, he's going to be a big ass man. That's a big kid. Joe, I take off after Joe. Joe takes off running. Now, my dad and his friend, Joe, Joe's dad, aren't far from where little Joe's throwing these rocks at. Little Joe runs over beside the truck where my dad and his dad's at, thinking I'm not going to do nothing. My dad don't know at the time that he just busted my sister in the head with a rock. <clears throat> and I was taught if one fights, we all fight. Somebody does something to you, somebody in your family, you give it to them. You give them the business, right? All I remember, man, I can remember this shit very clear running down this gravel road. And all I, I, all I could see was red and black. If you ever been so mad that you see red and black, then you can understand what I'm saying. Maybe it's some disorder I got. But as I'm chasing him, all I can hear is like the wind rushing by my ears and like a calm silence and my feet hitting his gravel. He slides upside his dad. I come around the side of the truck, full speed punch Joe. Boom! Grab him, sling him over the gravel. You want to hit my sister with a rock? And I, I start messing Joe up, man. I'm giving Joe the business. Beat the shit out of Joe and them rocks. Well, the problem comes in the fact that my dad treated us like animals. Like he thought that if he said stop, like a dog, you should stop. The problem with my anger is when I snap like that, I don't hear anything. I don't hear anything going on around me. I'm just focused on the task at hand. I'm focused on who I'm fighting with. I continue to kick Joe's ass, right? My dad snatches me off a of little Joe. You got to remember the plug is his best friend. And they're both standing there watching me beat up the plug's son. My dad snatches me off of him. And I'm still trying to go at him. 
And my dad commences to beat me up right there in front of both of them, in front of this kid and in front of his dad. My dad, you know, fucked me up beside his truck, put hands on me. Facts. I'm just a kid. So now me and Joe on, we go to the same school. We go to the same bus stop. Now we're at the bus stop come Monday morning. And Joe's talking shit to his little friends. With Joe's dad being the plug, Joe had the, the fresh Reebok pumps on. He had the Charlotte Hornets starter jacket on, right? I ain't We ain't balling like Joe and his dad. My dad sells drugs for Joe's dad, right? So he keeps a different group of friends than I keep. He's got the friends, his little his little buddies and them. They got money. My friends are more of the little dirty, grimy crew. I mean, and at the time I was going to East, I was in, it's he called East Lincolnton where I was going, right? Out in Henderson. I hear him over discussing what's going on and he's lying. He's trying to make it seem like he beat me up. So I throw my book bag in the gravel. And I'm like, what's up, man? Come on, let's go. I throw my hands up and I go towards him by the time the school bus pulls up. We get to the school, they call me in the office, what's going on with you and little Joe, ain't nothing, if you do anything, you know what the consequences are, the consequences for fighting back then was the paddle, we can call your dad or, well call him my dad is not an option, because with him it's going to be the fist, or you can get paddled, big ass paddle, they would whoop your ass with, the vice principal used to do it right, you heard of them paddles that have holes in them, it's real, this shit looked like an oar from a boat, like a rowboat paddle, this shit was serious, now, if you, I mean, I've been paddled before and it left my ass and the lower part of my back black, blue, and green, and yellow. The teacher would go to jail if they did something like this today, but that's what they did. If you get into it with little Joe, you can catch the paddle. So I'm like, all right, so now I know I can't do this at school. I can't do it at the bus stop. I am not trying to catch that paddle, and I'm not trying to catch them hands from my pops, right? <coughs> Joe doesn't live far from where I live. What I mean doesn't live far, maybe 500 feet is where him and his dad and his brother, which his brother died. I heard about that. Rest in peace to to the dude's little brother, man. And his mom. Maybe 500 feet separates us from everything that's going on. Sunday school rolls around. And if you if you you grew up in that life or in a poor neighborhood, you know about the Sunday school bus. Your ass is getting on that Sunday school bus, not because our parents wanted us to be holy or go to church, but because church was like a free babysitter. It was a break for the parents on Sunday. That little white bus comes rolling through the neighborhood. You get your ass out there and go to church. We're on the church bus and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I can do this on the church bus. I'm not thinking about church or none of that. I'm just thinking I kick his ass on the church bus. You know what I mean? What's the worst that can happen? <coughs> We get to arguing. I'm trying to fight with him. And the, they got a like a monitor, like a school bus monitor, but it's a lady that rides a church bus. She separates us. And Joe says some of the craziest holy shit out of his mouth you could ever say. How you going to move? I die, do this and do that. And you acting like this and you acting like that. Your daddy's a drug dealer. I knew at a young age not to say anything in response because that's snitching. Most kids' response would have been, your daddy's a drug dealer too and sells my daddy the drugs that my daddy sells. I didn't say none of that. I'm just like kind of blown by the fact that he just said this in front of all these people because I know the severity and how much drugs are involved, right? We get home that evening and this kid lies. Flips the whole story around and takes his words and puts them in my mouth. Tells his dad that on the church bus, I told everybody his dad's a drug dealer. Now there's a storm brewing. Now my dad and him are going back and forth. They're beefing. And this ain't no petty beef. This is a crazy story I'm about to tell y'all. So if y'all listening, stay tuned. This ain't no petty beef that's going on. There's a lot on the line here. And if the police get word of what was said on that church bus, a lot of key players and big people are going to go to jail. This is going to make headline news if this shit gets leaked out by one of those adults on that bus. That driver, that lady was on the bus when these kids tells their parents what was said. <coughs> so, now my pops and his best friend, dude he grew up with, they're at war over what was said on this church bus. Over everything that started all over this kid hitting my sister with this rock. We're sitting inside the house one day. 
Just me and my daddy home. Nobody else. My mom's gone. My brothers and sisters are gone somewhere, and I don't know where they went. But as we're sitting in the house, I hear a gunshot. And there's a section of woods behind where we live at. And right on the other side of them little bit of woods is where Joe lives at. The gunshot comes from the tree line, from the woods. Pow, it hits the side of the trailer. My dad tells me, get down. Yells it, get on the floor, lay down. My pops, even being a convicted felon, convicted murderer, kept a lot of guns. He didn't care about none of that. He stayed war ready. He goes over to the gun cabinet, snatches the gun cabinet up, and by now, several different shots are hitting the trailer. You can hear it's two different guns hitting the trailer. Two different guns being fired. Ta -ta, pow, pow, pow. They're shooting and bullets are coming through the trailer. My dad tells me, run to the back and get a blanket. I run down the hallway to the back bedroom. I'm looking around, grab a blanket. I snatch the blanket off the bed. Come running back in the living room, I throw it on the ground. My dad grabs his guns and starts throwing them on the blanket. Throwing them on the blanket. He's got these 30 r sixes, these 12 gauges, the old Russian AK-47 Klitschnikov. Revolvers, pistols, you name it. He fills this big ass blanket up. Tells me, he tells me, grab another sheet, grab something. And on the back of our couch, we got like this knitted Afghan throw. If y'all know what those are. I look around, I grab that off the back of the couch and he starts throwing ammo in it. Like boxes and boxes of ammo. Tells me, and this is all true. My mama's watching this. She knows it's facts. Tells me, come on, follow me. We had a sliding glass door on the front of the trailer. He slides the door open. These dudes are firing, like firing at where we live at. Don't care if this kid's in there. I guess they see my mama's car gone. So they figured my mom and the kids were gone. It was just my dad there. Well, we've got this old ass broke down Dodge pickup truck sitting beside our house off in this little field right there. And there's a big ass log splitter that's been broke for many years. Laying there. One of them old school log splitters. You had to tow behind your truck, right? And Dad tells me, come on. I'm scared to death. People are shooting at the fucking trailer we live in. They're in the woods and I can't see anything. Where it's coming from. Who it is. We know who it is. And we have a good idea who the second guy is. Doesn't take common sense. I know who the other person was that hung around. He's dead now. My dad says, come on, run. I've got this Afghan thing over my shoulder full of ammo. My dad's got this big ass blanket wrapped up with all these guns. We run over and we post up beside this truck. Now the bullets are hitting the side of the truck. Shooting the windows. All the windows are going out the truck. Luckily, it's one of those old ass trucks. I mean, this truck is old. It ain't one of these trucks you run into something that puts a dent. It's one of these trucks that if you hit somebody, you'll tear their shit up. And then it ain't going to do nothing but maybe scratch your paint. And pop. Takes the first gun, comes up over the back of the truck, and lets fire on the wood. It's just aims it and just starts squeezing off side to side at the wood line, right? They stop firing for a minute. He ducks back down, drops the gun on the blanket. And every time he's dropping a gun, he's telling me, load it, load it, load it. So now I got to look at these boxes of bullets and try to figure out, all right, that's an AK-47, 7.62. Take it, take the banana clip out and start loading them back up. He's got the 30-06 out over the hood. Pow! Bolt action. Just letting it buck off into the wood line, right? Drops down, load it. Now I'm looking for, you know, these bullets are going to 30 out of 6. Takes the 12 gauge. This shit goes on for a while. When I mean a while, we're talking a good 10, 15 minutes. And where we live out there, it's not uncommon for people to shoot guns. This is Henderson, North Carolina. This is country area. People shoot guns around there. This gunfight keeps on for 10 or 15 minutes. Eventually, the gunfire stops. I also had to run back to the trailer at one point and get more ammo. My pop sent his 12-year-old kid running towards the trailer to get more ammo. I'm running. They're still shooting at my dad. They're not shooting at me, but they're still shooting at him. I run to the trailer. I get more ammo. I come back over there, start helping him load guns up, and he's steadily bucking back, right? My pops had been shot in the past. I used to watch him pluck buckshot out of his leg. True story. That it healed over the years underneath the skin. Every now and then it would surface like I said. He'd pop them out. <coughs> the gunfire stops, right? And Pops takes a 12 gauge and one of the pistols. Goes running towards the woods. Bucking off the 12 gauge. Got the pistol running in his pocket, right? They done retreated back up to where they're going. My mom shows up. The truck's all shot up. The trailer's got bullet holes in it. 
we know something's got to happen. My dad is a killer, man. He was a killer. 100%. Anybody knows who James McMillan was. My dad was a murderer. He would kill you if you tried him. Everybody knew that. His name rang bells in the streets. He had took out one of the toughest guys in South Side of Richmond back in the day. And that's what ended him up when he got out of prison. He moved to North Carolina to keep from killing any more of these dudes, right? So everything dies down. My dad's nighttime will sleep. He's pacing throughout. Just waiting for this shit to transpire. It doesn't come. I already know that if they bump past when they see each other, it's going to be problems. It doesn't come. We get called to court. The guy Joe bought the piece of land that we lived on. So now he owns where we live. So we had to move. My mom convinces my dad we need to leave North Carolina. Or you are going to kill these guys and leave all of us behind. That gets us to the part of how I ended up in Richmond, Virginia. We loaded everything into U-Hauls, put that pop-up camper behind uh, one of the trucks, and drove from North Carolina to Richmond in the middle of the night. Ended up parking that camper in the backyard of my uncle's house, my Uncle Albert Ray. And six of us lived in that camper until we got the first place we could live, right? We move around for a little bit here in Richmond, and then we moved to Amp Hill. That's where I would meet all my permanent friends. Prior to that, we was living out Richmond. I was going to Bouchard, you know, middle school and different schools out there. Then I ended up going to Fallen Creek, then, you know, Meadowbrook. Then we moved again, and I went to George with. But in moving out there at 13 years old, I met the majority of these guys I'm going to tell you about in today's story. First guy, I'm going to leave his name out of it because he is dead as well. If y'all haven't noticed by now, there's a lot of death. So I'm going to leave his name out the story, even though he wasn't the greatest person at the time. I'm not going to put his name in here. We're just going to call him Buddy. I got this homeboy Buddy I meet when I move around the neighborhood, and he's a good-sized dude, man. Straight up. Known for fighting. Would fight his ass off, right? And the first time, ah, shit, I can't say it's the first time I've seen him do something shady because he had done a lot of shady things to other people. But the first time it hit my ears that he had done something shady that bounced back towards my direction, I was in my 20s. And I'm living at this house, and my, our house is the party house. Girls coming and going, guys coming and going. You know, I was roofing for a living, and the guy I stayed with, he owned a roofing company. He loved to party. You know what I mean? He smoked crack on the weekends is what they be doing. In the bedroom, locked in there getting high. But outside of that, man, we just drank beer and liquor and smoked weed all day, shrooms, whatever we could get our hands on, right? I just didn't do that crack shit. So my homeboy comes over, man. We had this big-ass party one night, and we need some weed. Tells my homeboy, Yoke Yoke, and we call Yoke 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 Yoke. Because his head was shaped like a damn egg. So you know there's like the egg, the egg yolk. We called him yolk yolk. Because of the shape of his big ass head. Tells my homeboy buddy. You know what I mean. Hey I'll give you a ride to get the weed. Just throw me some weed and throw me some gas money. Bet bet bet. All right. Three hours goes by. Yolk yolk ain't back. Comes back finally. And I'm like damn dog. Y'all get lost. Man your homeboy is some shit. I said what's up. What he do to you. He's like man. I gave him, you know, I gave him a ride and we go to get the weed and we pull up in his shady ass neighborhood. I said, what? He was like, yeah, man, like the projects. He was like, man, your homeboy got out the car, told me, wait right here, I'll be right back. He said when he come back, he's drinking a soda. He got a soda can in his hand. Gets in the back seat and tells me, don't go nowhere yet, sit right here. He said, I look in the back seat, your homeboy's got a soda can, has poked holes in it and it's smoking crack. In the back seat out of a soda can. I said, no. He's like, yes. He's like, that's not the worst part, man. Jay, that's not the worst part. I said, what's the worst part? He said, we're sitting there. And I see something out my side mirror. And I look back. And two dudes run up on the car. And snatch the door. But when, he, when they do, he throws a sack of crack in the can up front. Right beside me. I said, oh, man, you go to jail? He's like, no, they saw him throw the can. Saw him throw the crack. 
They watched him just come out the crack house and were sitting there watching him smoke crack in the back seat. These are cops. I said, oh, shit, what happened then? He was like, he tried to tell him it was mine. I said, oh, stop playing. Yeah, buddy told him it was mine. I said, all right. He's like, they knew it wasn't mine. They seen him go in and get it. They t you know, searched the little car right there. And he's like, we're parked around the corner from this house. He's like, they searched the car, got the crack, and told Buddy, you going to jail tonight. Kind of like training day. You want to go to jail or you want to go home? He chose go home. They give him some money. He's telling me all this. I watched him give him some money and send him back up in that house to buy some drugs. I said, what? He was like, yeah, man, straight up. He went in there, bought some drugs, came out, handed the drugs to the police. Police told him, y'all can go. You're good. Pull off. And as we were leaving, more cop cars were showing up. I'm pretty sure they was getting ready to raid that crib. I don't know what to say at this point. I'm sitting there kind of stunned like, yo. I said, where is, where is dude at, man? He said he had me drop him off at somebody's house, man. He didn't come back with me. He had me drive way out my way after all this to drop him off. That's why it's been hours, man. We was out there for a minute. I said, man, that's crazy, bro. So I hollered at him. like, what type of time is you on, bro? talking to the police the fuck is you talking about i told him the story he said man ain't none of that shit happened he made that whole damn story up bro like yeah we got high we smoked some crack but ain't none of that happened i said man the man saying that you dealt with the police he's like he's a liar man maybe he was high and he made that shit up but that shit ain't happened i ain't talking to no police i ain't get no police no crack i ain't go get no crack for no police he's a fucking liar and i'm gonna beat him up when i see him he always wanted to beat everybody up because he was big as a bitch big dude right so i'm like man i don't know about this shit i tell yo 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 it's like i'm not trying to fight his big ass but that's what he did jay that's what he did so now there's a conflict of interest because i ain't never heard nothing about this like this about my own boy before right so i don't really know what to do but i fall back from him all right i'm gonna distance myself from this dude because i don't know what the fuck's going on we fast forward about a year or so Living in these projects, Somerset Glen. For y'all to know where that's at in Richmond. Living out Somerset. Was we in Somerset Glen? Yeah, we was in Somerset Glen. Living in Somerset Glen. I have a bunch of people over one night. We're in there drinking. Rolling big dumb blunts, just getting high. You know, music blasting. People coming and going. And some of the people show up. My homeboy buddy shows up with him. What's good, Wood? I ain't seen you in a minute. All right, yeah, 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 whatever. Party slowly starts to wind down. It's late night now. 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm still drinking. The girl I'm with was heavy in the, I was with at the time was heavy into drinking. He's drinking. We're smoking. Big sacks of weed. Just smoking weed, right? Buddy says, hey, man. Let me hold a couple dollars. I said, man, I ain't even got it like that right now. Once I, once I re-up and sell some of this weed, I got you. I'm like, come on, man. I know you got money. Let me hold like $40. I said, bro, I can't do it. He starts crying. I mean, really crying. I said, what's, what's, what the fuck is you, what you crying about, man? I need to get some crack, man. Like, like Pookie, man. That shit be calling me, man. I really got to get it, man. And my mind's set on it and I got to get it. I said, man, you need to chill the fuck out, man. That shit ain't that serious. The girl is telling him, man, you better than this. You better than this. Like, you got to fight it. Like, come on, man. You, you got to stop this. Yeah, y'all right. Y'all right. Y'all right. I said, look, man, I'm going to make you a drink. Chill out, man chill out now we had a couple bottles of liquor sitting there on the living room table and we had some other bottles in the kitchen i said what you want the liquor he names is in the kitchen so i go in the kitchen making his drink putting ice cubes in it throw some soda in it mix some liquor in it and i hear the front door slam i don't think much about it i hear this front door slam again walk in the living room I'm like where'd she go where the hell did he go they're the only two here i don't see neither one of them we got a sliding glass door. I go to the sliding glass door and look out the sliding glass door. And she's out there fighting with this big ass dude. He's got a bottle of liquor in his hand. And he's got her purse. He just snatched the whole purse up and went out the, out the door, right? She chased out behind him. <coughs> Never said, Jay, he's got my purse. Nothing. Just she was drunk. She took off after him, right? So I, I look out and I'm like fuck man by now he's dropped the bottle of broken liquor and he's got the person she's got the person that pulling back and forth right something told me to grab a knife 
I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just because I knew how crazy he was and how crazy he get. But I look over and I look around and there's a steak knife, one of the nice stainless steel handle steak knives in the strainer in the sink, right? I grab the steak knife out. I run out the door and it's a good thing I did because now he's dropped the bottle of liquor and all he's got is the neck of the bottle and the broken part hanging out. And he's telling the bitch, give me the purse or I'll cut you. Give me the purse or I'll cut you, right? So I run up on him. I'm like, what's up with you, homeboy? And I pull the knife back. And when I do, he slashes at me with it. I move out the way, move forward, sticking. Here's the weird thing if you've ever stabbed anybody. It does not feel like it is doing the damage that it is actually doing. If you've ever stabbed somebody, when, you, when it happens, you try to apply more force because it doesn't feel like it's doing anything when it's reality it does not take a whole lot of force to stab somebody you could like that and put a blade halfway through somebody so oh you start you stab me you stab me you stab me by now he's let go of the purse she's took the purse backed up the people in the projects out there know this dude and are up now they hear all the yelling and commotion we're fighting in the courtyard and they're telling him stab his ass jay telling me stab him jay kill him kill him motherfucker kill him kill him Oh man, all these people are watching this shit. Lights are flicking on. They're all looking out the window and it's no bullshit. People coming out in their balcony. It's the projects. Music's still bumping. There's people out there getting high, smoking weed, smoke crack, doing dope. And they hear this and they look out and see it. And they come out and start chanting me, oh, kill him, Jay, kill him. Oh, I'm going to kill you. Start slashing at me with his bottle like a wild man. Well, he's a big dude, so he's a lot slower than me. So every opportunity I would get, I'd move and stick him again with it. Stick him again with it. Stick him again with it. To the point I done stuck him five, six times now. And this big son of a bitch is still coming. Somebody calls the cops. Somebody always calls the cops, right? I hear the sirens coming. By now, he's collapsed on the sidewalk. Boom. I fell to his knees. That alcohol is wearing off and the severity of them stabs is kicked in by now. I tell the girl, get in the apartment. Run upstairs. And we're in the apartment and I'm looking out the bedroom window i got the window cracked up well actually these windows slid sideways i slide the window sideways i lift the blinds up a little bit and i'm looking at the windows and he's telling him jay telling the cops jay stabbed me he lives on the third floor in the apartment on the left the top on the very top of the staircase third floor apartment on the left man he got guns and everything up there this dude stabbed me i said oh my fucking god I grab a backpack, grab all the little shit laying around that ain't supposed to be in the apartment. I ain't got no time to waste now. They're coming. I put all this stuff in the backpack. I zip it up. I see another cop pull up over there and back into a parking spot. And then I see the ambulance pull up, right? Well, we've got this side window that's not facing them. I'm looking around like, what the fuck am I going to do? There's no way to get out. I got to go down the staircase as the cops are coming up to pass the cops to get out of here. So I wait until I see the two cops running in the, through the front door of the building. I drop the backpack out the damn window into the bush. I hang out the window. I can hear them talking to her inside the building, inside the room. And she's telling them he ain't even been here tonight. I don't know that dude. And Jay ain't been there. He's not here. I'm hanging on to the edge of this window. And the first one I climbed out, I had a lot of strength. And I reached up and closed the window back. But the blinds are still up. I'm hanging. And I see a cop over there beside the ambulance. And I'm like, shit. So I let go. I fall, boom, fall in these bushes, grab my backpack up, I take off running through the projects and I jump this fence. There's a work van sitting there, a painter's van. I'm checking vehicle doors, trying to get in the vehicle. They're all, it's nighttime, right? Open this, grab the side door of this painter's van, boom, the door opens. I jump up in the painter's vans and I take the cloths that they put down so paint don't get everywhere and I cover myself up. I can hear the cops out there everywhere looking for me. Somebody had told him he ran that way, he ran that way. So now they're on my trail looking for me, right? They didn't catch me. Even though he gave them my name that night, he didn't give them my full name. So they didn't know who they were looking for, who to press charges against, right? Never saw him again after that. I would always hear he was talking shit about me. I don't know, you know what I mean? In his mind, if we were on good terms or bad terms, he died a couple years back. But I didn't harbor no hard feelings towards him because he forced my hand that night in what happened. You know, I, I understand how people get when they get caught up in their madness. Rest in peace, homeboy. I'm sorry they had to come to that. Sorry you lost your life. But yeah, that's some shady shit. 
That's that shady sh That's that shit I don't like. Stay tuned for part two. Coming to a theater near you soon. Nah, just joking. Part two coming soon. The video was very long. Had to give y'all the backdrop on how I met the people I met. How I showed up here in Virginia. What led me here. A little more on my dad I've talked about in the past. A little bit on some of the dudes I was hanging out with. And I got a lot more. I could probably create a damn channel off of this. But I'm just going to keep it. The way we keep it Keep it real That's what makes me a real one No fabricating No lying to kick it No none of that Just be honest with yourself And what's happened in life Man that's what you know Part of what makes you a real one Part 2 coming soon But anyways These jails Detention centers Streets Projects All just Crazy world Side of this Already crazy world We live in And as always Y'all know what I'm doing I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. And to all my real ones, and there are some real ones watching, because y'all still watching me. Y'all know how we do, man. Salute.